definitely I wouldn't even go as far as saying it's imposter syndrome on my part like it I am an imposter teacher you know oh no don't, don't say that you, you, you you're, you're <laughs> doing a good job hello listeners welcome back this is what kind of Asian are you podcast a podcast featuring conversations about being Asian my name is Kyle I'm the host if you want to support this podcast there are several ways you can do so one, just to keep listening to us, subscribing to the podcast wherever you listen to, share this with your friends and family, and follow the Instagram at what kind of Asian pod. And now to talking about our guest today, a very special one. What she kind of does is what I want to do in some sort of way as well. So without further ado, we have Brittany from Cantonese with Brittany with me on the show today. Hi, Brittany. How are you doing today? Good. How are you, Kyle? Thanks for having me on the show. <laughs> I'm very excited because... If I am correct, this is one of your few first podcast appearances so far. Yeah, you're right. You're right. You're really underselling what you really do. You just like, oh, I'm just sharing my <laughs> life. But like you do a lot of stuff where it provides a lot of value in terms of those that are looking for content specifically for Cantonese. How was your childhood like? All the stuff that you know, makes you who you are. Yeah. So, um, well, both my parents actually went to U of T, University of Toronto when they were younger. And so they were quite familiar with Toronto Canadian culture. And um, they brought us up, m myself and my older brother, in a very, I, I don't know, very, but you know, to me, it was very Cantonese culture. On the other side, like I spent a lot of time with my mom's side of the family, which is another um, cultural situation, because my mom's actually born in India. So her family and my papa, my grandmother, they spoke a lot of Hindi and then also a lot of like Cantonese mixed in. In terms of like my Chinese exposure, my parents didn't really like force feed it on us. They were very, I would say, especially my mother because she, she's also an overseas Chinese herself in some ways. They presented Cantonese culture to me in a very open and loving kind of way. So I never felt like it was, you know, and I mean, half of the time it had food involved, you know, which is huge for me. I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of uh, your listeners can relate. I mean, food is, is paramount. Yeah. Universal <laughs> love language for sure. Exactly. Exactly. In your childhood that you have a strong, strong interest in Cantonese culture or just the language as a whole for yourself. I mean, I think ever since I was little, I've always been very aware of the concept of language. My dad, he spoke Cantonese, he spoke Mandarin, he speaks Tsutawa as well, like Techu. My mom speaks French, Spanish, English, and Hindi. So the idea of language has always surrounded my family. And so very early on, I took an interest to Cantonese because growing up, I could speak it to a certain degree. But when I had um, family from Hong Kong come over, it was, there was a glaring difference. I mentioned this in a different podcast where I was saying like not necessarily my parents but aunties and uncles outside will comment on the fact that my accent sounds funny or that it's a very like joke sing you know mm. overseas kind of sounding Cantonese I think as a child you can either take it as a I'll never speak it again or um, let me try to do what I can to try to speak in a way that they won't say that I have a very good relationship with Cantonese in the sense that I've always tried to speak it. Um, people have complimented me on my proficiency as an overseas kid and also the connections I've been able to make through Cantonese with native Cantonese speakers in my life. I hope that through my channel, I'm able to inspire others to do this as well. Did you really yeah. kind of uh, had a lot of time and focus on Cantonese specifically with like Saturday's Chinese school, or it was very casual for you? Um, so actually, Chinese school wasn't Cantonese Chinese school. I oh. went to a, um, I think it was like Taiwanese school, oh. I want to say. Yeah, so I learned all the oh, wow. for a few years. Yeah, and I mean, that just did not stick. I mean, I didn't even speak Mandarin, right? Yeah. So it was very, very tough. Our grandmothers would live with us sometimes, and the only way I could speak to them was in Cantonese. So part of the reason I really wanted to learn Cantonese was to be able to talk to my grandparents, just to be able to chat with them. And that was kind of the driving force behind all of it. Now, especially with Cantonese being like almost a language where it's kind of less and less prominent around the world. 
a lot mm-hmm. of people, especially overseas, are be like, oh, I need to save it. I need to keep it continue in the family. Then I mean, I have to force them to do things like Saturday yeah. school, no English at mm-hmm. home and stuff. And I'm thinking like, oh, but then a lot of the successful people I know that are like professionally Cantonese that are overseas, Cantonese was a force of them. Do you think that made a big part in your kind of learning? I think the main thing is that my parents never forced it on me. And it was always just part of our day-to-day living. You know, there was a period of time where I was spending more time at school with my friends and I was speaking a lot of English at home. And my parents would, for themselves, they wouldn't mention, they wouldn't say it explicitly like, oh, you have to answer it to me in Chinese, but they would only speak to me in Chinese. I would understand. I would respond to them in English. And then slowly, I guess I just conformed back to speaking Cantonese with them. Something they told me though, when I was younger, and it's something that sticks with me to this day is that they either said, Brittany, you know, you're Canadian, but you have to remember you're also Chinese. And because you're Chinese and you look Chinese, people will expect you to speak Chinese. Being Chinese, Hong Konger, what have you, you know, that is very tied to my identity. Aside from food, I think language is the second biggest cultural marker of a culture. I think that's a really good advice. People like my age, when they were growing up, we were kind of without a lot of influences, without a lot of like guidance. We like, you got to pick a side. You're either really bobby or like really asian or you're really kind of like western did you feel that Mm -hmm. when you were growing up um i definitely had moments in my life i've kind of uh adhered to this principle is that you can actually have your cake and eat it at the same time Mm. we might have a hot pot party and i'll make an apple pie that kind of thing and i think that's beautiful you know and it's it's our own thing to be able to have that is it's okay Another interesting thing I found, your education after high school. So can you just talk about your kind of journey from after high school? Yeah, so I actually did apply to Canadian universities, but I got rejected to all of them. Oh. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Part of the reason I wanted to go to the U.S., my parents, they were kind of adventurous to begin with. I mean, they went to school in Canada on their own. And then, you know, they wanted that for me and my brother as well to experience something different from what they had. And so, yeah, I went to Purdue University in Indiana, which is completely different from any place I've ever lived. Yeah. And then after college, I went to New York City to study fashion design. My brother was there as well. So we had the opportunity to be together again. Yeah. And that was also a pretty interesting experience because I could finally express myself creatively being in a creative environment like the environment in New York was just completely different so initially when you went for school what was your kind of like dream job that you wanted or was it always just fashion design it's just you took like a detour in a way I can't really say I've ever had like a dream job per se what I'm doing right now is closest to what my dream is creating something that people enjoy I'm basically doing what I want when I first started I didn't know. Honestly, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I mean, I went to New York City with the intention of working in fashion. So I went to fashion school. And then so I ended up working at a fashion house in the garment district in Manhattan. And there I worked as a uh, design assistant. And then I eventually went into sales as well for like almost two years. Oh, wow. And I remember I was reading somewhere where you talk about how during your experience doing fashion design or like in that industry, you were able to end up using like Cantonese with the people that you're interacting with. It must be really special for you. Like, oh, I'm able to use the language that you know I spoke at home to do the work mm-hmm. that I need to do. More than half of my company were women from China or Hong Kong or even Vietnam, but they all spoke Cantonese. I think it was one of the highlights of working in New York for me because they became family to me. Being able to go to work every day, see the same aunties, bid them a Josan, you know, that kind of thing is just, it's an irreplaceable kind of experience and moment that a kind of connection that you have with other people. The factory people also spoke Cantonese, you know, Chinese New Year, they'd give me at Lycee, they'd give me red packets. My birthday, they'd give me red packets. And like people working with me, they're like, what's going on? Like, why are you getting money? And I'm like, don't worry about it. You know, (laughs) 
<laughs> it's part of the culture. Yeah. And like just receiving the same kind of, or the similar kind of hospitality that I would receive from my mom, from my grandmas, that kind of feeling is just, you know, is very special. So how long did you spend being in New York working before you took on the next step of your career per se into like content creating? So I was in New York studying and then working for five years. And then um, at that point, I had already met my husband, Jared, and I had kind of burnt out in the fashion industry. I mean, it's not as glamorous as people put it out to be, you know, I mean, what you see of fashion, that's like the marketing, but behind the design, it's like a lot of hard work. And I think at that point, it wasn't creative for me anymore. I moved on to content creating. And I think at that point, actually, I was thinking about doing something that would give me more options in terms of jobs, because what I was doing, there's only a certain amount of jobs available for fashion designers in New York City, unless you want to start your own uh, label. So I decided, I said, you know what, I'm going to give graphic design a, a, a shot. You know, I like drawing. I like making little graphics. Let's see what I can learn and what I can make out of this. One of the classes I took was on animation. And so Jared came up with the idea of Can't Use with Brittany, actually. He was like, you know, oh. it'd be... Yeah. <laughs> he said like, you know, I really want to learn Cantonese, but there's so few resources out there. And I was like, you're right. You know, then of course, as always, there's this kind of imposter syndrome that kicks in, you know, I'm like, but can I teach Cantonese? Like, I don't even speak it that well. So as I was taking this course, I did a little bit of animation. I can maybe do little characters and move their mouths a little. Jared wrote the, the stories. He made me learn Yut Ping. <laughs> <laughs> and he learned it himself. And it was kind of a, a little passion project that started from him wanting to learn Cantonese. And then slowly it evolved into, we suddenly realized like this is going to be a very good product for people out there because there are people like me who think like, oh, I'd like to improve my Cantonese, but I can't read Chinese. I definitely don't understand standard Chinese. English subtitles help some, but like if you really don't understand anything, like how are you going to learn it? So that's kind of how we got onto that, that path. That's amazing. I want to have guessed it was from like your husband wanting to learn Cantonese at all. I think the mm -hmm. biggest thing with Cantonese is that people aren't aware that there are content available to consume, to you know, help them learn. I think that's the biggest barrier for more people to pick it up. Right, exactly. And then there's also the issue with, there is actually a lot of Cantonese content in Asia you know, but it's not exactly accessible to the likes of me who does, well, I mean, now I know how to read and write a little more than I used to, but like when I started um, a little over a year ago, I was like, couldn't tell a word from another. There's no way that I would be able to sift through all those pages on Google to find what I want to watch. Mm -hmm. Taking the first step is also very hard for those that want to pick up their heritage language after years yeah. and years of like leaving it behind. Exactly. Yeah. I think one of the things is that when I started this, the content that was available was either too elementary, I guess, or like too geared in, like towards learning, you know, like sitting down and hearing a lecture kind of feel. And then it's also too intimidating. I'm at a level where I can watch vlogs from Hong Kong vloggers. But if you don't understand up to that level, like what are you going to watch? You're, you don't want to always listen to children's stories or you don't always want to learn the grammar for why you use this versus this you know it can get a little dry I understand and that's not for everyone you know someone like my husband Jared who loves languages he'll do that but that's not for I would say the typical learner so I thought you know the kind of stance that we always try to take in our videos is to keep things light keep things simple and try to make it fun so that people enjoy watching it and then maybe over the course of watching 20 videos they'll pick something up you know yeah, so would you say, Lau, your kind of focus with the channel and the content that you create moving forward would be more just promoting the Cantonese language in the diaspora community versus actually like what people kind of think of you as, as like you're one on YouTube teaching Cantonese, you're the teacher and that kind of thing. Because I think that would be a lot of pressure for any kind of overseas Chinese person to take on because realistically, unless we grew up in Asia where we're learning a language natively and all that stuff. At least for me, maybe I have imposter syndrome or whatnot, but like, I want to have like the confidence to be like, oh, everything I'm teaching is up to par and all that stuff. 
that's yeah. kind of your feelings right now with like how your channel is going and stuff yeah you're right on the money i mean definitely i wouldn't even go as far as saying it's imposter syndrome on my part like it, i am an imposter teacher you know oh no I don't, don't say that you, you, you you're, you're <laughs> doing a good job the thing with teaching languages is that how do you learn a language or the language that you speak mainly right now? How did you learn it? You learn it from your parents or whoever raised you, right? My parents aren't language experts. His parents aren't language experts, but they still taught him a language. So I think like as far as language learning goes, the most I can do is teach it in a way, you know, a mother would teach it. That's kind of what I try to do in my videos. And yeah, I think I am trying to move away from that teacher label because I just don't feel comfortable being like, oh, I'm a Cantonese teacher. I mean, like Jade's a Cantonese teacher. Yeah. Uh, Kahe from Poetic Cantonese, he's a mm. Cantonese teacher, you know. But from my angle, you know, as a quote unquote teacher, I think it's just more of like the immersive aspect of language learning. That's kind of how uh, a mother would talk to a baby just like moving towards that is kind of the the future for our channel just to like keep things light and enjoyable for people so that they can take what they learn from actual teachers you know mm -hmm. and then enjoy my content if you're mm -hmm. from overseas and try to pick up the language it's great that you try to learn but don't expect to be native or like don't have the pressure on yourself to be native that will cause burnout in terms of learning a language. Well, it's funny that you mentioned that because um, in my journey of making this channel, I've actually gone through that feeling myself while making these videos. And I think that's also part of the reason I want to shed this um, label of being a teacher is because in the last few vlogs that I've done, I've made mistakes. I'm trying to own up to it in the sense that it's like, Sometimes I forget the word for bean, mm. you know, yeah. even though I know it. Talking a lot about Cantonese and I just want to know why is it important for you? At well, earlier we spoke about like dream jobs and all those kinds of things. My dream is actually to be a mother. Ever since I was little, I've always wanted to have a family. I've always wanted to have children. I love to share that culture with them and give them a sense of belonging, give them, you know, a sense of that culture that I grew up with as well. And it really helps that Jared also enjoys it. So I think that's, that's definitely my driving force. And when I think of my children, <laughs> when I think of my future children and that, I also think of my viewers, you know. Your husband now is kind of learning Cantonese so that he could like at least understand what you would be saying to your future children and all that stuff. So how mm -hmm. is he currently doing with his uh, learning progress? Because I've seen the video of you no, testing him on his Cantonese with like that durian challenge and all that stuff. How would you say his Cantonese proficiency right now, if you were to mm. give him a grade right now out of 10? <laughs> oh, out of 10? Oh, over a year ago. Like when he first started, he had trouble with um, the pronoun, like ngo, le, koi, and oh, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that was the extent of all he knew. But now he's also become really good at you ping. He's starting to really nail the tones and he's learning a lot of words every day i feel like i'm talking about a child um but yeah i would say like from one to ten he's maybe at like a three or four that's good in the year that's great yeah. and for all the listeners that want to see your content support you where can they find you and what are the future plans for Cantonese with Brittany as well? Yeah, so of course you can find me on YouTube, uh, Cantonese with Brittany, Instagram, Cantonese.with.Brittany. I'm also on Facebook. You can also check out my blog at CantoneseWithBrittany.com. I try to write uh, blog posts attached to my videos that, you know, I can express myself in English a little better than I would in Cantonese. You can find yeah. me on Patreon as well. You can get Yuping subtitles and Chinese subtitles through our um Patreon. There's a lot of good content on Patreon. We're hoping to, you know, boost that up even more and create more value for our patrons. So yeah, in terms of the future of Cantonese with Brittany, gosh, um, it's really hard to say. With the pandemic and everything, there's a bunch of things that I want to do, a bunch of collaborations with other creators. I think Jared and I are hoping to include a little bit more of him onto the channel. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, and then also bolstering our Patreon as well. And then, yeah, we'll see what's to come. It's really hard to say. You know, mm -hmm. we're always trying to think up of new ideas. And I'm very happy to be able to have this conversation with you. It was a lot of fun Likewise. and very Thanks, nice to hear your story and your perspective. Keep doing what you're doing. You're doing such great work, very inspiring and um, all the best. And thank you again for doing this. Thank you. Thanks for having me here, Kyle.
And uh, for all the listeners, thank you for listening and uh, join us again next time on What Kind of Asian Are You? And make sure to subscribe to the podcast, follow the podcast on Instagram at What Kind of Asian Pod and share this with people who you think would uh, gain value from this. And until next time, bye-bye. <laughs>